So we're going to get started today, um, and I um, want to talk about uh, today how we're going to deal with ADHD doubters. And, and the way I want to start talking about this is by talking about five common myths about ADHD and the facts to dis debunk them. So dealing with doubters means educating them. Blame, shame, criticism are not only destructive to relationships, but they deny someone's reality, your reality, or your child's reality, and they minimize their experience. So today we're going to challenge those myths with facts. And I'd love to hear from you along the way what some of the challenges are that you're dealing with. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Zoe. Hi, April. Um, to hear some of the challenges that you're dealing with. And we will go through these myths that I've identified, but they're just some that uh, I've identified. I'm sure you can share with me, and I hope that you will, some of the doubters in your life and how they've affected you and how they're doubting you. So we could try to uh, change that. So the first myth is that ADHD isn't real, that everybody has a little ADHD and it's just a recent psychiatric invention. And the fact is that ADHD has been around for hundreds of years, but not commonly known about or named. The first example of ADHD um, was given by Sir Alexander Crichton in 1798. Uh, in 1894, a German physician named Heinrich Hoffmann created a, some illustrated children's stories, including a character named Fidgety Phil. Um, and in 1902, Sir George Frederick Still, who was a pediatrician, discussed what he called an abnormal defect of moral control in children. Um, that sounds so pathologizing and negative, but I'm just sharing the facts here. Hi, Gay. Um, so treatment for ADHD was actually discovered by Dr. Charles Bradley in my neighboring state of Rhode Island in 1937 when he was looking for medication to alleviate post-spinal tap headaches in children. And he found that benzedrine, which was an amphetamine sulfate, resulted in short, dramatic improvements in kids' learning, motivation, and behavior. Previous names for ADHD are equally heartbreaking um, to the moral control comment. They include brain injured child syndrome, hyperkinesis, which was actually the formal term in the uh, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual in 1968, which was the second version, uh, hyperactive child syndrome, minimal brain dysfunction. These are all so negative, they're heartbreaking for me. Uh, in the 1970s, researchers observed that hyperactive children can also have chronic problems with inattention, and both issues were improved with stimulant medication. So in, in 1980, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual here in the United States finally named Attention Deficit Disorder, and the diagnosis rate climbed in the 1990s due to better diagnostic description and clarification of symptoms, but also more parents recognizing this in, in their children and a greater awareness in medical and mental health fields. In 2020, uh, the latest version of the DSM, uh, the DSM-4, um, it came, the DSM-4, excuse me, the DSM-4, because it was followed by the DSM-5, which was uh, within the last 10 years. In, D in 2020, the DSM-4 came up with ADHD with hyperactivity, impulsivity, inattention, and a combination type. And more or less, that's what's been around for the last 20 years. Um, so that's all the history, and I think that the history of the disorder is very helpful when people say, oh, it's not really real or everyone has it. That's not necessarily the case. So let's talk about um, why that's not the case, which goes to myth number two. Um, ADHD is overdiagnosed and medication is overprescribed and addictive. So the fact is that around 10% of kids in the United States and 5% worldwide have a diagnosis of ADHD. And the worldwide um, criteria for adults is is, who've experienced it at some time in their life is about 6.76%. To receive a thorough diagnosis, of course, the process is complicated and very thorough. It's more than filling out a form, but rather includes a thorough history and assessment of cognitive abilities, learning capabilities, and attention. 
Medication is more stringently prescribed than it was 20, 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And studies have found that when kids and adults with ADHD are given appropriate medications that work for them, the medications reduce the need for substance abuse and, uh, and what we call self-medicating. Medications do not help everyone who has ADHD, and some people can't tolerate the side effects or don't see positive changes. Of course, we know that pills don't teach skills and that ADHD is a condition of um, limited um, or challenged executive functioning skills. So the most effective treatment for ADHD has been found to be a combination of medication and cognitive behavior therapy or family education uh, that includes a strong component of parent training when children are involved and um, per, you know, personal therapy or coaching for adults. Now, let's go to the third myth, which I think is really key. ADHD is lack of willpower. Kids could focus if they want to. They're lazy and unmotivated. And this would be true for adults as well. You, you could do it if you wanted. So the fact is that ADHD is a biologically based condition related to the neurotransmitters of dopamine and norepinephrine. It's a chronic condition marked by persistent inattention, hyperactivity, and sometimes impulsivity that is more frequent and severe than is typically observed in children, teens, or adults of the same age, ethnic, and cultural background. It is an impediment to living a life that you would like to be able to, um, to live. It's not about laziness or purposeful distractedness. People with ADHD can focus more easily on things they like or things they do well. We all can do that, but this is important for them because of the dopamine networks in the brain, because we know that dopamine is a neurotransmitter that has to do with satisfaction and interest and reward. So this focus uh, on activities they like, it comes more naturally for all of us. It's when you have to concentrate on things over longer periods of time that are boring, challenging, or unrewarding that it's especially hard for people with ADHD, whether that's work meetings, classroom lectures, or homework. Even with hyper-focus, it can be challenging to tough out a spelling sheet or completing that project for your boss. Kids and adults with ADHD can focus on things like video games or a sporting event or a show or a concert for longer periods because of the sights and sounds and physical activities or requirements that are part of that experience. Myth number four, ADHD is caused by poor parenting and a lack of discipline for children, teens, and adults. False, false, false. ADHD is a biologically based condition that is the most highly inherited mental health issue. Over 50% of adults with ADHD will have a child with ADHD. That also means that a child with ADHD has a 50% chance of one of their parents having it, right? Um, ADHD also runs in families. If one child in a family has it, there's a 33% chance that a second child has it. Where hereditary isn't a factor um, exp during pregnant, uh, where hereditary isn't a factor. So if you didn't have someone in your family who has this, uh, difficulties during pregnancy, prenatal exposure to alcohol, drugs, or tobacco, premature delivery, high lead levels, and postnatal injury to the prefrontal cortex regions of the brain can all contribute to attention issues. Behaviors related to living with ADHD can cause severe conflict in families and strain parent-child, sibling relationships, spousal partner relationships. Parent-child relationships, there's a higher level of hostility, lower parental responsiveness, harsh discipline, more child non-compliance and disruption, and a lower sense of, of, of parental competence. You don't feel like you're doing a good job. Parents of kids with ADHD re persistently re report more stress than 83% of other parents and deal with more negativity. Teaching executive functioning skills and working on building these skills is key to improving family relationships as well as living more successfully and effectively with ADHD. 
routines based on compassion, collaboration, logical consequences foster the essential connections between parents and building those executive functioning skills. And the fifth and a last myth that I'm identifying is that most kids with ADHD just outgrow it. And so if you wait, it'll turn out fine. Well, that's actually not true. Approximately one quarter or 20% of kids with ADHD appear to outgrow it. So that means 80 to 85% of kids don't outgrow it. Interestingly, the methods for measuring and diagnosing adult ADHD are just simply not as robust as those for children. And so adults who outgrow ADHD, it can be a number of factors. It could be due to misdiagnosis um, initially or the development of adequate self-management tools to manage, to minimize the effects of ADHD interference on daily lives. Adults are more capable of making changes to their home and work environments and to take advantage of personal strengths. They can lean into things they want to do and they're good at. They don't have to be good at everything like kids. You have to take math and you have to take social studies and you have to take English even if you know, writing is hard for you and you have a disorder of written expression. Um, adults also have more autonomy in choosing what they do and how they do it than kids. And so in this way, ADHD may seem to interfere less with their daily life and they may report that they've outgrown it. It's questionable. So I hope that that um, description of those various myths is helpful to you. And now I would love to go and do, to go through your comments and start some conversations. So. Uh, Gail says, my doubters tell me I'm just looking for all the attention. Both my 19-year-old da daughter has it, and that's when I was diagnosed at 36. Well, that is great, Gail, that you actually got a diagnosis. And the idea that you're looking for attention is just <laughs> absurd. I'm sorry to laugh because I'm sure it's painful. But why would you look for attention in that way? Wouldn't you want attention in a different way, in a way that, we're, that feels more positive, in a way that's more you know, affirming? You're wanting attention in a way where you're struggling, in an area that's painful for you? That just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, uh, yes, that myth is untrue, Michelle. Adult ADHD is a disaster. Joe, tell me a little bit about why it's a disaster for you, and let's see if I can offer some assistance. Gail, it's especially hard for me at 50 because I could hyper-focus and did well in school. Right, and so this is a challenge for a lot of women with ADHD. You know, you, you, you were able to do well in school, you held it together, you focused on things you liked, you got through, and perhaps if you had some anxiety, that anxiety drove you as well. And now, you know, it, they're like, that can't be true. You can't have ADHD. You were fine as a child. And so I think it's important to remember that ADHD looks different in women. And, you know, we've talked about this here in these uh, live events before, and we can certainly do that again. But to, be a, to have on top of your, you know, have at your fingertips some facts about women with ADHD and when they're diagnosed, which is usually later in life. Carol says you, that she never felt good enough. I'm sorry to hear that. I mean, I think this is true for a lot of people that you receive so much negative feedback along the way. And doubters in particular can make you feel like you're crazy because you know you're living with something and it's real. But the feedback that you're getting is you are, you're mistaken or you're messed up or, you know, that's not true. There's a kind of a character assassination rather than just, you know, a, a, an acknowledgement that what you're experiencing is real. Gail says, now my 19-year-old has been refusing any mental health supports. She's quit therapy again and all other DMH services. Um, it's really hard for emerging adults to come to terms with their ADHD. They can be angry. They can be resentful. They, they may not like themselves. And to be in therapy is just another confirmation of why they're not okay. Um, I think, you know, a, a lot of times kids have to make a journey, and it's so hard for us as parents to witness this, to get to a place where they can say, yes, you know, this is me. So the journey for your daughter is how to accept the brain that she has. And m maybe she's not had helpful mental, he mental health supports. Perhaps coaching might be more useful to her. It's very present oriented. Um, I hope that she's able to get the resources she needs. 
Thank you, Jay. You're typing right now because it gives you something to fidget with. Awesome. Tina, I gave my daughter the tools to know when she's having a big reaction and the tools so she can deal with it. Well, that's critical. See, that's the thing that I think is so important that doubters don't understand. Doubters think, well, you could control yourself better, right? And, um, you know, actually, that isn't that, maybe that's true. But if what you may deal, de deal with is still that flood of intense feelings. And when you have that flood of intense feelings, the the op what are the options for you to remove yourself or go to the bathroom wash your hands or take a step outside to settle so you can regroup about something and i think that's really helpful um uh um you know because you know you're not going to necessarily reduce the reaction you're not going to get rid of the reactivity that's part of how you're wired it's how you respond to it yes holly there will be Zoe, just had to put the mini me to bed. One thing that gets me is the OU oh, or your child can't have ADHD because you're so intelligent. And Tina says, exactly. So here's the thing. Let's talk a little bit about twice exceptionality. Um, there are many of you out there who are super bright and have ADHD or and, maybe super bright and have ADHD or be on um, level in the level one uh, or high functioning autism spectrum or who may struggle with dyslexia or a, written, a disorder of written expression. You can have all of these things. Intelligence has nothing to do with that. Yeah, you know, learning disabilities are actually also neurological conditions and they, can't, they also run in families. Um, and um, you can be super intelligent and still struggle with working memory or processing speed or other ex or a variety of executive functioning challenges that um, s that slow down your ability to manage yourself or respond e efficiently. And so I think that's really important to say to people is like intelligence has nothing to do with ADHD or a learning disability. They're completely separate. Uh, Renee says they just need to play outside more. People will say that to you, and yes, physical activity is super important for all of us, I believe, and particularly for um, kids with ADHD because those endorphins actually bathe the brain in in the in, in good stuff in helping them show up, and it does. They kind of act. They get their bodies active, and then they it might be easier to settle. Um, um, I know. Um, that you that um, Annie, if you could put up an article about the benefits of exercise for ADHD, that would be great. That my Kara says that my kid can just fix his behavior. ADHD is not real and has nothing to do with how the brain is wired. So this was part of my myths that I delineated. That's false, false, false in every account. ADHD, you can't just fix your behavior because you don't have the executive functioning skills yet to be able to do that. And the executive functioning skills mature with about a three-year lag in ADHD brains. So um, that's, uh, that's one thing. They can't, you can't fix your behavior because it's related to your biology. And it takes time for your brain to mature so that you can get there. And two, it is real. I've already explained that. And three, it absolutely has to do with everything about how your brain is wired. Um, let's see. Let me go down. Anna, I have three kids with ADHD, and for them, it doesn't travel alone, meaning comorbid conditions. It's difficult to hear that my children's issues are discipline related. So that's an important thing to really refute, that it is a biologically based condition that has to do with um, the, neuro, the neurotransmitters and learning executive functioning skills. And because of the, 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 the way the brain is wired, there's a delay in learning those skills of up to three years. And we wanna be super clear that we talk about that with people because um, it's not about having, you know, it's absolutely has nothing to do with being more disciplined or I should discipline them more. You know, that book, French Kids Don't Have ADHD, made me crazy. Um, it's also not true because I have a, a couple of friends who are psychiatrists in France and that book made them crazy too. Um, Zoe, another myth is that you can't have ADHD because you are exhausted. <laughs> 
<laughs> now really adults with ADHD are very often exhausted. Yes, because you're trying to manage your own executive functioning skill deficits and those of the family or the, your kids. You're like, you're on a, it's a double dose of, of working on the thing that's just exactly hard for you. So of course you're exhausted because it takes a lot of effort to, um, to manage uh, your challenges and then to be the engine of the family to manage everyone else's. So yes, you can be exhausted and have ADHD. Melissa, ooh, your child disrupts my tutorial groups. He needs to learn how to control himself. Um, uh, we, we've addressed this before that yes, your child can learn certain tools and they may they need cues for using those tools. Michelle, my son getting a diagnosis of mixed ADHD has been a huge learning curve. Realizing I probably am ADHD myself and it has allowed me as strongly and followed me as strongly into adulthood. I did not know anything about ADHD before and it's so hard to see my child go through the difficulties, especially when I can relate. You know, I want to say something about this. Michelle, this is such a, a beautiful um, summary of what it's like for so many parents living with kids with ADHD who are also discovering later in life that they may have it. And I think that um, you know, as parents, it hurts us when our child struggle. It hurts us to see our children struggle. Excuse me. And so um, I think that we want to be able to, you know, kind of acknowledge where they start and where we where they end and where we start and where they and where we end and to be able to identify their challenges as theirs to see if we share some challenges and how we could maybe support each other or work on an executive functioning skill challenge that we that is there for both of us and to be able to just give them compassion and love them for who they are that's really important um, your, Becky says her 14 year old struggle, struggles with the side effects. Galit says I'm pretty sure it's one of the sources of my chronic fatigue. Um, I, it very well could be. Shanita, my son is 18 and going to college and I worry that he will fail because of all the demands. Focusing on lectures and completing assignments, ugh, Facebook got rid of it. So here's what I want to say. Um, um, your son is going to college and the most important thing you can do is make sure he registers with the Office of Disabilities um, because having ADHD is considered um, a disability that you get services for in college. So whatever the services are that he's had in high school, we want to carry those over to college, whether it's note taking, time and a half on tests, anything like that. Make sure he registers and that you help him set up who his, who his um, you know, person there is going to be and the kind of support that you're going to line up. Uh, Facebook is, let, is moving these uh, comments through so I can't see them all. I'm very sorry. Anna, why would older siblings be so hateful to a little sister because she's great at school, hyper-focused, and really super active, but she falls apart when there's nothing to do? Then it's identified that she has epilepsy also, so they cut her off. Why? That is so sad to hear. And I think sometimes um, siblings will be mean to a sibling who has ADHD or epilepsy or some kind of neurodiversity because it either threatens them or they, uh, they have compassion fatigue, they feel like the treatment in the family hasn't been fair or even to them, and, and they're fed up. And so we really have to nurture some empathy in these older students, uh, uh, um, excuse me, older siblings. And, and the question is, you know, why are they angry? Are they angry at her? Or are they angry at you, the parents, for not handling things differently? And that's a really important question because it's, it's okay to be angry at you. You're an adult. You can take it. You're, all, you're doing the best you can with the resources you have available. It's not okay to be angry at her. She's a child. Um, let's see. Leslie says, do many young girls show severe SPD symptoms and signs as precursor to ADHD? I wouldn't say that it's a precursor, but I would say that it accompanies it. And, you know, I think uh, the, the statistics are that kids with ADHD, like 10 to 20 percent of them have sensory processing challenges. So um, they can be, you know, coexisting. Um, you're welcome, Zoe. And yes, you are a TUI family. That's great. Um, does the three-year lag go into adulthood? So the prefrontal cortex here in our brain coalesces around age 25 in neurotypical brains, and then with a three-year delay, so around late 20s for people with ADHD. Tina, 
that is very frustrating and hurtful. People don't who don't deal with it just don't understand. I think that's true. I think people who, who, don't, who don't deal with it don't understand. And I think people are also misinformed and, and they see it as an excuse rather than actually a, con a condition that you're trying to live with and a way to explain why things are hard or easy for you. Yumna, uh, I feel the whole idea of a three-year-old lag is also a myth. Having a different way to process the world doesn't mean that a child is delayed or have some sort of slow way to learn. I agree. I don't like that terminology of a delay, the, but the fact is that the, um, according to research, that these frontal lobes, you know, really connect with the rest of the brain, you know, and they come that those connections are solid around age 25 and that those connections occur a little bit later in ADHD brains up to three years. So you can call it a delay or you can call it, you know, you know, taking its, it, it taking its own path. Um, but the terminology, the medical terminology has been a delay. But I, I also feel like, um, you know, the, the word delay can be very pejorative, so I see what you're saying, and thank you for bringing that up. Shanita, thank you, Leslie. I've contacted them. The key is that he has to advocate for himself on campus, especially since he's over 18. Not sure that he will. I've been doing this his whole life. Right, but what you can do, Shanita, is you can make sure that you're with him, that he is setting up um, these services on campus and to talk with him about why it's important and it's much more private in college than it is in high school so if he's concerned about being judged or um, or you know having his secret out he, he doesn't have to worry because it's more anonymous um, Allison scared for college for my son with ADHD so bright but executive functioning is going to be a major struggle so it is a struggle for a lot of kids with ADHD who are bright and going to college because ha they have to manage life and school and when they lived at home they managed school you mostly manage life um, and uh, you probably also helped manage school and so now they're on their own so this is why it's important for them to ha to use the disability services have a tutor, have someone they touch base with every week because we want them to succeed in their first semester. And that's the conversation to have with your son or your daughter, which is, this is these are the supports that helped you get through high school. I know you don't want to use them in college, but let's assume that this is a huge transition for you, because it is, and that having more supports initially will stabilize you. Then later, after the first semester, when everything is more familiar, then you can make other choices. But right now, you're having to adjust to your environment, to making friends, to um, living on your own. It's a lot. It's a lot for the brain. Um, Yumna has a question. The question would be ADHD kids be, the question would ADHD be kids be lagging or delayed if the whole learning environment was designed to fit their needs? Um, I believe that the brain development would still be, would still take the same course. Paula, all my friends like to go to movies with me because I get up and down so many times I get them popcorn. That is hilarious. Thank you, Paula. Um, I'm happy to go to the movie with, with you anytime. Um, uh, okay, so a lot of you are concerned about your college students going to um, your your kids going with ADHD going to college. I'm wondering if maybe we should talk about that next week uh, instead of self acceptance, although that's super important. But I can see that there's a lot of need around this particular issue, so um, we'll we'll discuss offline and get back to you. Um, Leah, my 13-year-old is three to four behind, uh, years behind himself maturity-wise. I feel I have two nine-year-olds on all accounts. That's probably true, actually, and you probably do. And that's hard because your 13-year-old is 13 in other ways, maybe physically, um, in terms of you know movies that he can watch and things that he can comprehend. So it's very frustrating and confusing. Uh, thanks for posting that information, Annie, about college. Um, yes, it's very important. You want to make sure that the 504 accommodations are in place. Leslie, I had the best ADHD coach at college and she was free for me to see every week. That is the benefit of using the disabilities office. The coaching is free and great. Sometimes feeling compassion, Dina, for your child is difficult because a lot of the things that make you crazy about them are also the things that make me crazy about myself. Inability to get and stay organized, losing things, etc. 
You know, I'm so glad you said this. Now it makes me think we should do self-acceptance next week um, because um, it is hard to come to terms with your own limitations and and then to see the things that you've struggled with in your child the, the, is not something that you really want to witness and it's also frustrating it's like ugh i've already figured out i'm still i've hopefully figured out or i'm still figuring out how to deal with this on my own and now i have to help you do it and you're not interested in my advice it can be very frustrating um Thank you for having us. You're welcome, Tina. It's my pleasure. Gail, my doubters make me feel like a bad parent because of her behaviors and don't believe either of us have anxiety and say we're looking for attention, not that we're having anxiety attacks. I, I think you just need to like tell these doubters to like take a hike because they're way off. Don't let them make you feel like a bad parent. That's on, you know, they can do whatever they want and how you respond is on you. I'm sure you're a very good parent, Gail. You've, you've already told us that you've gotten your daughter, you know, therapy and services. Um, ADHD and anxiety travel alone and people may just not want to hear about it. And that's a different situation because if they don't, they don't want to hear about it and they're not um, ready to be compassionate or empathic, then those aren't people that you really need to spend a lot of time around. Because you need to be around people who are your people and who understand and love you for who you are. Which college? LOL. I know these supports exist at college, but I worry he'll miss the appointments, not reach out, etc. Again, if you set up this structure so that the, 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 the coach or the tutor or whoever reaches out to them initially, that's useful, and then put it on their um, phone with an alarm and an alert. You're welcome, Stacy. Wendy, how do you help an elderly person who has undiagnosed ADHD and also has age-related and stroke cause of cognitive decline? So um, I think for elderly people, that's a whole separate area of, of treatment and usually uh, geriatric services is familiar with this. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. Um, Allison says you went to Westchester University. Excellent, many great experts in that area, particularly Ari Tuckman. yay Ari. Um, and I think Matthew Zakruski lives in Philadelphia also, and he's a 2E expert. Um, those going to uni in the UK, definitely talk to your uni's disability services. I am returning as an adult for an M psych, and they have to be brilliant. They will give extra time, a mentor, assess needs, computer, disabled student allowance, all sorts. I got this before for dyslexia, but they have screened me for ADHD whilst waiting for formal medical diagnosis and will still put all they can in place. That is fantastic, Zoe. And good for you for going back to school for your M psych. Fabulous. Holly, why is there so much doubt and misinformation in the mental health field? It's very frustrating and discouraging when seeking treatment. Holly, I agree 100% with you. I feel like mental health professionals are not adequately trained in um, assessing, diagnosing, and understanding ADHD. I think that's why the work of Attitude is so important and their various um, webinars that they offer. It's something that I try to do in my professional life. Uh, I think people don't understand it. and. Um, and I think particularly if you're more psychoanalytically oriented, you're not, you're not as uh, adept or, or as interested or skilled or willing to focus on the cognitive behavior aspect that is so important when you're working with kids with, and adults with ADHD. Because in working with people with ADHD, it's a, it's a dance. It's a dance between these cognitive behavioral interventions and, and um, you know, um, uh, in, in improving self-evaluation, uh, metacognition, self-understanding, and, and, and history and emotion and trauma. Leah, I'm nervous and scared for my 13 year to go to high school next year because he's three, my 13 year old to go to high school because he's three to four years maturity wise behind and I trust others, I trust him, others not so much. Yes, and so it's important, important, Leah, that he gets um, the services that he needs, and um, and that might include um, maybe some family counseling or some coaching, so he can learn how to navigate. And there's also just the fact. The fact is that he will learn through experience. Um, that's how he's going to best under you know get those tools. And sometimes those experiences, unfortunately, are not going to be super great but sometimes they will be. And the most important thing for these kids is to have a few friends, maybe two. One to be with, and one in case that person is busy. 
Uh, Randy, I always use services at college. So much help. Some colleges don't have the best services. And if your college does not have the best services, then I think it's important to look into, you know, what are other options, either a mental health counselor or a coach. Uh, Melissa, one recommendation for parents of high school seniors is to have the school complete the up an updated evaluation as colleges will need current evaluations. And if it's older than three years, you need to reevaluate. That's true. So when your kids are, if you have kids who are uh, rising seniors or, fin or in their 13 year, um, in their last year, their year of 13 in uh, the UK, um, uh, then you want to make sure that they have an evaluation so that when they go to uni uh, or college, that they, 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 it's fresh, and so they can't. This colleges can't say, oh, well, this is four years old. We don't. We only take them for three years. Um, Gail, it's my own family, the whole family that are my doubters. Oh no, Gail, that's terrible. Oh, that breaks my heart. So I think um, I think maybe it would be useful to work with someone to come up with a few phrases that you can say when people are treating you this way. Um, that really helps. Um, you know, I, I tell a funny story, but it's. Um, you know, um, I remember my uh, my mother-in-law moved here, and she did not have ADHD, but she was very cranky, and my, and people would, at my friends would say, oh, you know, she'd come to dinner, and my friends would be here, and she'd say, oh, how are you doing? And she said, ugh, I'm terrible, I hate where I live, blah, blah, blah. And so I sat her down, and I said, um, Pauline, you know, when people ask you how you are, I don't think they really want to hear, ugh, I'm terrible, I hate where I live. Could you say something else? And she said, well, I'm not going to lie. And I said, you don't have to lie. What you can say is, I'm adjusting. It's not how I, it's not what I thought it would be. And so she thought about that for a minute and she did that. And the response from my friends was so much different. It was like, yeah, I can imagine it's hard to get used to it. And this is true for adults and kids with ADHD. Having a couple go-to phrases in your back pocket when people say things is really helpful. And one of those phrases can be, you know, I'm not sure how to respond to that, so I'm going to take a break and come back and, and let you know. Or I need to think about that. Or I wish you wouldn't say something like that. It's really hurtful. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Set your limit. Um, it doesn't make it easier to have an ADHD diagnosis before your children get a diagnosis. It made it easier to identify which of my children had ADHD, but I still cry sometimes when I see them experiencing the same struggles I did as a child, especially when it comes to making and keeping friends. I feel so bad when my girls struggle in friendships. I remember feeling like everyone else knew how to be in the world, and I didn't get the rule book, and I know they feel the same way. Mm. I can understand that, and we've talked about some social anxiety here, and we'll be talking about it again. In fact, I believe that Carolyn McGuire is doing a webinar pretty soon about how to help kids transition back to school, uh, and her book, um, Why Will No One Play With Me, is, is a great resource for that. Um, Heather um, was diagnosed in private school. It's hard to wait even though he's four and a half. I've had success with DBT versus CBT for a for combined ADHD. DBT is great um, and it's also great for ADHD. It might, um, it can be more useful because it, it's particularly useful for people who struggle with emotional control um, because you can identify what's happening and, the, and make different choices. Thank you Leslie for sharing that. Uh, what advice for a non-ADD spouse married to one with ADD? Uh, we talked about this a couple uh, uh, Facebook Lives ago. Uh, that's a sh short question with a long answer. But in general, um, what we want to think about um, is you know, where are the areas where ADHD is really showing up as, as, a, as an issue in your relationship? And how can you each respond differently to, what, to what's happening? Uh, I think that um, there's a couple great books out there and some uh, attitude. Melissa Orlov and uh, uh, Edward Hallowell have both written books on, on ADHD and relationships. Michelle, I think my diagnosis of BPD should be ADHD. I was always told I was just attention seeking and black and white thinker. My doctor still won't listen to me about ADHD. Hmm, that's very strange. Maybe see someone else and get a different opinion. Um, uh, Laura Lee, my GP is, who's furthering her education in mental health just diagnosed my teen with myself with ADD and recommended your site. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. I'm so glad you're here. 
Tina, my daughter is 16 and just started her first job. I was a little nervous about her staying focused because in school she has a, pa a para, but she's doing great. Isn't that wonderful? And that has to do with that one of those myths that I talked about, which is that she's interested in her job. It's probably active. She's using other parts of herself and she's able to focus more. That's great. Um, BPD had to be ruled out for me because I was official before I was officially given a diagnosis of ADHD. Right. And so there can be some confusion about that. So you want to check that out. Um, Oh, they won't do that for you. Okay, bipolar is also mixed up with ADHD, yes. Gail, I'm considered the black sheep of the whole family, cousins included. Uh, Gail, I hope that you have a group of friends who consider you to be an awesome sheep um, because that, you know, you need to have uh, some affirmation in your life if your family's not giving it to you. Um, all right, I'm going to take one or two more. Um, let's see, Renee. I have ADD and my 13 year old has ADHD. Not sure how I would try and help him. It's hard. He thinks I'm just making excuses. You know what I would consider doing, and I think this is really useful, and um, I do have this tool in my book, Why Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew. Also, uh, Peg, um, Peg Dawson and Richard Goyle have lots of these. Um, uh, assessments where you can identify your you know your executive functioning strengths and challenges and if you did that as a family you might see where you and your kids are the same and different and perhaps decide you want to you know what is the what is the executive functioning skill you each like to work on the most and either how you can support each other if it's the same skill and if it's something different you know how you could be um, you know like a sag wagon uh, and and so that you can be with each other in learning something thank you so much for all of these fantastic comments uh, Zoe says black sheep are the best definitely find some more to go play with and make more um, uh, and make more mischief you are uh, uh, are good the white sheep need to go roll in a muddy puddle thank you thank you Zoe and Michelle you sound awesome keep going I'm the black sheep too but I'm taking it as a good thing because I don't want to be like my family anyway there you go you want to be who you are and you want to surround yourself with people who love and accept you and sometimes that may not be your family or they may be broadcasting on a channel where they're sharing their love and you may be wanting to receive it on a different channel so clue into their channel receive it and then don't pay attention to the other stuff Gail no I don't probably due to my ADHD and anxiety my daughter behavior and anxiety they hold me um, responsible for her actions but I do have multiple supports good I'm glad you are not responsible for your daughter your daughter is responsible for her what is the next program uh, it will be next week um, at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and uh, right now the next the plan for the next program is self-acceptance how we can love who we are with ADHD thank you so much for joining me today it's great to be here it's great to be back and be with all of you um, I will see you next week and I hope that you have a good weekend take care of yourself and debunk those myths with the facts that we've talked about today and the many resources available with attitudemag.com. Thank you and have a great, uh, a great weekend.